because we have the enormous good fortune of having Professor Akhil Amar from Yale University, Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science, uh, 30 plus years at Yale University, um, arguably the premier constitutional historian and theorist in the country today. He is requested by congressional leaders, the presidents, uh, put on your seat belts, uh, get ready for an incredible intellectual ride. Uh, we are very fortunate. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited. Um, like you, I'm a teacher. Um, and uh, I actually teach about um, twice as much as um, I'm required to do, a little over twice as much. And my wife always asks me, you know, why do you teach so much? And I say, because they let me. Um, and um, since I mentioned her, I, I need to be straight with you because I'm going to um, ask you for a very, I'm going to make a very big ask in, a, in about a minute. And um, uh, so, um, I drove up three hours yesterday and he heading back. Fridays and Saturdays in our household are, are kind of tricky uh, because um, um, we've got uh, three piano lessons, a drum lesson, horseback, um, and um, uh, um, a, a recorder and dance. So that's so we got a 14-year-old and two 11-year-olds, and I'm supposed to. Have pitch in, um, and I'm AWOL um, uh, on Friday and Saturday. And um, so thank you, Vinitha, for letting me come here. And the reason she let me come here is because I want to talk to you. Um, and this is very exciting for me to be up here. I'm a teacher, too. Um, and now here's the ask. People come here, and, and people from New Hampshire value straight talk. And, and people come. I see my friend Gary Hart up there. He and I co-teach uh, together. Um, uh, I, in, in 1984, I was a third year student at Yale Law School. I founded Yale Students for Gary Hart because I thought he was actually the most interesting person to run um, that year. So people come, they knock on your door, and they introduce themselves and they ask for something. But they're, it, it, at their best, they're straight. They ask for your vote. And, and, and I want to ask you for something, which is um, uh, your time. Because uh, you guys are very interested in the Constitution, and so am I. Um, and we can't cover all the things that I, I've already heard your, your interest in the questions. And I'm going to try to talk about the, the things that I already heard you ask about. Um, but we don't have enough time in an hour to go over all the things that, that interest you. That's why I wrote these books. And I'm asking you, I don't care if you buy them, although they're, you know, frankly, they're inexpensive. This one, America's Constitution and Biography, is like 12 bucks on Amazon. Um, this one in hardbound, America's Unwritten Constitution, is 20 bucks on Amazon. That's not the expense of the thing. The expense of the thing is it's 500 freaking pages. It's going to take you a month to go through, and this will take you a second month. So I'm actually proposing what you should do on your summer vacation. Okay. Um, that's the expense. That's the ask. And I need to persuade you now in this hour that it will be worth your time, actually, um, and um, what you will learn. Um, because uh, I spent all my life, basically, is poured into these volumes. And if you read them, you will know, I'm being very straight with you, about 75% of what I know about the Constitution. Um, and, uh, and so let me, um, and I'll compare it, for example, to this, which I just, uh, I didn't, just learned about. Because this is fine, but there is a difference. And I, you know, uh, and I... <laughs> And yeah, I'm picking on a 14-year-old that, you know, but I'll, I'll, we, let's talk about, because there are two issues about the Constitution. What does it mean, and what are the rules, and how do we go about interpreting um, how them? How, how do you find answers if, the, if um, the book doesn't tell you what the right answer is on something? How can you as a citizen, as a teacher, as a student, figure out what the right answer is, because this is not supposed to be opaque stuff. The reason you all, actually, this is a different copy. I got one here. I, I've got about seven different versions of the thing, but this is the one. No, this is another version. <laughs> uh, but the one that was handed out today, um, I'm going to pull up. These are pictures of me and my chainsaw. I'm very New Hampshire, but, but you're not as interested in, in that. Um, this one today. Here's the point. 
you can read it. This was, is a short document so that 225 years ago, ordinary farmers from New Hampshire could read the thing and decide whether they refer it or again it. Okay, that's why it's short. And, but we have to have some common rules about how to go about interpreting it, and the rules are not opaque either. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to begin to have a conversation with you about, and, to, and I'm hoping that you can have a conversation with your students about, about what it means and how to interpret it. And I'll make one promise. I know people come here and they ask you for you know, a big thing and then they make all sorts of promises and, and sometimes they keep them and, and sometimes not so much. My promise to you is if you engage this, um, you've made a friend for life in me, you email me, you give me a call, I will, and if I miss it the first time, just email me again. If you want me to Skype into your classroom, happy to do that, um, to continue conversations. Um, I want, to basically reach we the people, uh, because this is an extraordinary democratic project. We are the custodians of it. You in New Hampshire understand this. You take stuff really seriously. You take your politics at your best really seriously here, because um, stuff that happens here matters disproportionately every four years. Um, <laughs> and um, so, um, I um, would be delighted to engage your students because our project is to keep this um, uh, Republican or Democratic, I'm going to say there's not a big difference between them, um, uh, um, um, this enterprise of, of collective self-governance, this we the people experiment. The last best hope of earth, it's our responsibility to keep it going Thomas Dewey is absolutely right. We're always one generation from barbarism. This is the renewal process, okay? Because citizens, you know, you're absolutely right, um, Michael Sandel, are um, made and not found. And, and we make them. We teachers make them. Um, okay, so let me um, tell you just very briefly about these two books and go over some of the issues that I heard people ask about. Then I'll step back and maybe tell you a little bit more about um, the, the larger th themes of the books um, and then continue our conversation. So this book, America's Constitution, a biography, is just a long-winded, um, but I think worth it, um, version of what you just heard. It walks you through the written constitution from start to finish. It's called America's Constitution, a biography. And this one purports to, um, but I, I just, and I just found it, you know, uh, 15 minutes ago and started flipping through it, to, and I'll show you the differences um, uh, between them, because um, uh, we need to understand what the rules are, how they came about. So this one starts with the preamble. It just walks you through the text, just, just the, as of the, my pre the previous speakers have done, the preamble. Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 4, which is about the states, 5, 6, and 7. Then the amendments which are appended in chronological order, interestingly, and so we carry the story forward through time. So um, the act of ordainment, the legislature, the executive, the judiciary, the states, constitutional supremacy, then the Bill of Rights, Reconstruction, the Progressive Era, the modern amendments. The amendments come in generational spurts, interestingly, and so the story carries forward through time. This walks you through the written constitution from start to finish. This one purports to, and there is a difference, and you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, why um, uh, in a few minutes some of the bigger substantive themes of this book, but it, it, and it will take you a month. That's your homework, okay, because democracy, at republicanism requires virtue. Um, and, and requires sacrifice, and, and it's, it's, it's the democratic project. Now, here are the three big themes of the book. The Constitution is more democratic, small d, than you were taught. We all, whether we realize it or not, we are, in effect, 
um, students of a man named Charles Beard, who wrote the most important book about the Constitution of the 20th century. It's called Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. He presented the Constitution as basically anti-democratic, uh, 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 pulled off by the, the, the wealthy propertied folks in a, in a kind of secret process in Philadelphia, arguably illegal, protecting property, trying to restrict the democratic excesses of the American Revolution, a response to Shays' rebellion. You heard even some of that in, in John's opening opening um, presentation. That was Charles Beard's vision of the Constitution, um, m that it wasn't so democratic. Mine is the anti-Beard vision. It's way, way more, and I'll give you uh, some, some evidence for that, way more democratic than we've been taught. Um, second theme is it was way more pro-slavery than we've come to um, acknowledge, uh, and that's why the system failed. Um, we, a massive failure, we call that the Civil War. So it's more democratic and more pro-slavery. And third, way more about national security than we've understood. Um, in a nutshell, and these three themes are reinforced. I didn't begin the book by trying to prove these themes. I tried to write a book where I would tell you what the preamble means, what Article I means, two, three, four, five, and so on, all the amendments. Then when I stepped back in retrospect, I was just trying to get each, each fact right. But in retrospect, these are the three themes that emerge, more democratic, more slavocratic, more about national security. If you forget the themes of this, go to an ATM and you'll get these green pieces of paper that spit out if you have a positive balance and you'll see Andy Jackson there. That's our original constitution. Democratic, low-born, small d Democrat, man of the people, big D Democrat, the most powerful political party in America in the antebellum period is a party that calls itself the Democrat Party, which if it's not a good word, why is the most important political force in antebellum America proudly asserting itself as the Democrat Party, the Democratic Party? Small D and capital D Democrat. Very pro-slavery too. You can be both in this early era. The, the Greeks had democracy and had slavery. So did the Romans. So did previous self-governing societies. So he's a proud slavocrat and he's a Democrat, and he can beat the Brits, okay? Um, as did George Washington before him, and every elected president until Abraham Lincoln, with the exception of one, is either a Secretary of State or a battlefield general. It's foreign policy, stupid. It's, it's national security, stupid. It's not the economy, stupid, um, with apologies to Carville. Um, who's the one, by the way, the only elected president uh, pre pre before Lincoln who is not a general or a Secretary of State? Uh, James Van Buren was Secretary of State. Uh, uh, Martin Van Buren was Secretary of State. Uh, J James Buchanan was Secretary of State. Franklin Pierce was a battlefield general, not a good one, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, and he was not good, frankly, at anything. Um, um, and he's one of our two worst presidents, and we need to talk about that, um, and why, and I will. By the end, you'll know why I say those things. Um, so um, he was a brigadier general in the Mexican-American War. Um, uh, Andrew Johnson is after the Civil War. George Washington, George Washington was a battlefield general. Someone say, here has said it. No, John Adams was, oh, you're right. John Adams was the de facto Secretary of State, but not the actual one of the Articles of Confederation. He was one of three, America's three leading diplomats, along with Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. We didn't have a Secretary of State before. So I'm, you're absolutely right. I'm counting him as, in effect, um, a Secretary of State character. But there was someone else who said it. Oh, James K. Polk. He's the only one, only elected president be before Abraham Lincoln who's not basically a leading diplomat or a battlefield general. More democratic, more slavocratic, more about national security. These three reinforced. It's Andy Jackson's America. That's Tocqueville's America. That's your constitution. It gives us, it's going to create a system where Andy Jackson and his vision is um, dominant and that system fails because of slavery. And we live in Lincoln's republic. The house was divided against itself because of slavery. We're going to talk about compromises. There were good questions about compromises. It fell, and it got reborn. And you and I, we, we in this room, are children of Lincoln. Um, um, uh, we live in a republic where Congress has um, all sorts of power because the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, all brilliant presentation, um, uh, 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 end um, with um, the words, Congress shall have power. See, how does the First Amendment begin? Congress shall make no law, dot, dot, dot. And the Tea Party folks say, yes, Congress shall make no law, period. You know, and the original Bill of Rights is, starts with a, the phrase, Congress shall make no law, ends with the 10th Amendment. It's a Tea Party, anti-federalist states' rights thing. But the Civil War 
it, um, generates a different vision, Congress shall have power. So we live in Lincoln's Constitution, a Constitution that affirms our equality, black and white, male and female, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, I would say gay and straight. Um, everyone's born equal, everyone's created equal, and Congress shall have power. That's a different vision, because the founders failed because it was pro-slavery. So ours continues to be a national security constitution, and a, um, a democratic, an increasingly democratic constitution. So you, heard, you saw the pattern up there. The pattern of the amendments are focused on uh, voting rights and expansion of, of voting rights very, very powerfully. So ours is a more de even more democratic constitution than the founders uh, were. It continues to be very much a national security project and now an emphatically anti-slavery project because the founders failed. Um, and this is a reminder that we might fail too, the republics do fail, and they fail when you just hope that you know, a slavery or global warming will just go away on its own without having actually a plan for making these things go away. Um, um, and Lincoln has a plan, a long-term plan. It, it happens, it ends up, um, slavery get, ends up getting uh, abolished uh, by a, a way different than Lincoln envisions. But I want my students to know how republics begin and how they end, how they fail, because ours could. And if you don't understand the, what, what precipitated the Civil War, then you can't figure out what might actually imperil our republic today. So that's the first book, America's Constitution, a biography. It walks you through the thing from start to finish, from the preamble through um, uh, the 27th Amendment in textual order. Now since I just, and then I'll talk about the second in just a minute, and then let's go over some of the questions that you had. But for example, why do we have the Electoral College? And you all in uh, New Hampshire think it's so that New Hampshire can be first in everything. Um, <laughs> now here's what this person says. Um, I, I just found this. Uh, and this is what you, you, uh, you know, some people were taught. Um, uh, um, so, and this book, I guess, comes out, um, well, it's got Laura Bush's endorsement, so it, com it comes out pretty recently. Um, so, when they, uh, the bottom line, this is the Electoral College, and she says, our founders wanted to prevent, what were they thinking? Our founders wanted to prevent states with large populations like Texas, New York, and California from dominating the elections. Okay, now of course, Texas and California don't exist as states at the founding, but okay. But she says it's because, actually it's, it's about making sure that large states don't win. I was taught this. Electoral college is a balance between big and small states. How many people were taught this? Yes, we were, hogwash. The, the Congress is a balance between big and small states. That's the difference between House and Senate. The electoral college is not. Simple question. If, if that's what their design is, weren't they nincompoops? <laughs> because, in all of American history, we've only had three small state presidents. Franklin Pierce, Zachary Taylor, and Bill Clinton, that's it. Okay, so they really were stupid if that was their goal. Uh, so balance between large and small states. Um, now, does George Washington come from a large state or a small state? He comes from Virginia, that's the biggest state. Okay, and then John Adams, that's the second or third biggest state, depending on how you count Massachusetts. And I'll tell you about the, depending on how you count, because it's about how you count slaves. Um, Pennsylvania otherwise might be the biggest. And Maine is part of Massachusetts at the time, of course, as we New Englanders all know. Um, and then it's Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and James Monroe, all from Virginia, the biggest state. For 32 of the first 36 years, it's the biggest state. For the other four, it's the second biggest state, or third, depending on your count. And for the next four, it's JQA, John Quincy Adams, again, from the second or third biggest state. So boy, they were income poops if it's a balance between big and small state. You're just, it's just stupid. And this is obvious early on, and by the time two big state guys are running for president against each other twice, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, you know, 1796 and 1800, the, the pattern is very, very obvious, and they change the electoral college, they tweak it in certain ways, but they don't change this. So it's not balanced between big and small states. It's not, look, I'm picking on a 14-year-old, I understand. <laughs> but she has, you know, the books that she actually lists in her bibliography, and mine isn't there, and so she doesn't know, actually. <laughs> Well, you can disagree with me, but I've given you facts, and your students need to know the facts. Now, why do we have the Electoral College? Because it's not big and small states. Now, here's another thing you were told. Because they didn't believe in democracy, and she says that too. This is the Charles Beard crap. That is not true, 
um, that dominated much of the discourse of the 20th century. He wrote the most influential book on the Constitution last century. I am an ambitious person. I'm not here to waste your time or mine. I have written, I believe, the most important book of the 21st century. It's this, you have to read it. You don't have to agree with it, but your students must know it. I will tell you, and I'll give you, why we have an electoral college. And it's not because it's a balance between big and small state, because the big state guy wins every time. Three small state presidents in all of American history. Bill Clinton, Zachary Taylor, Franklin Pierce. That's it. 32 of the first 36 years, it's the biggest state, Virginia. You know, the other four years, it's Massachusetts, and then the next four years. It's not a balance between big and small states, okay? Now, it's not because they don't believe in democracy, because they put the Constitution to a vote. And I'm going to tell you more about that. The Constitution was epically democratic for its time. It's the year that changes all of human history, never before in human history had so many people been allowed to vote on how they and their posterity would be governed. That's what those words, we the people, at the beginning actually mean. We're actually going to get to vote for the thing. Ordinary farmers are going to get to vote for the thing, decide whether it's, it's written for them, short, whether they're for it or against it, and they get to vote. It's stunning. In eight of the 13 states, property qualifications were eliminated or lowered for this special election on the Constitution compared to um, ordinary property qualifications for voting um, for state legislatures or serving in state legislatures. You could vote for the Constitution in several states, even though you couldn't vote for state legislature. You could vote for, you could serve in the ratifying convention um, in New Hampshire or other places in eight of the 13 states, even though you couldn't meet the ordinary eligibility qualifications uh, for legislative service. What property, so it's epically democratic for its time. Now, yes, women don't vote, but they've never voted anywhere in world history. That's not news, that's olds. That's just, you know, um, uh, welcome to the world at the time. In New York, every free adult male citizen gets to vote on the Constitution. No property qualifications, no religious qualifications, um, um, no race qualifications. You have to be free, and they're free blacks. Stunning. Did you know that before? I tell you that in the first two pages of America's Constitution and Biography, and you need to know. You, know, you need to know that fact because that is what they proudly proclaim themselves to be, is far more democratic than anything in world history. Here's what the man who writes the words, we the people, his name is, who, anyone know who, because you heard a lot about James Madison, and he's a slaveholder, he dies a slaveholder, I like him, but I don't love him. Um, who writes the words, we the people? No, not Governor Morris, he's a lawyer. Um, uh, from Pennsylvania, but another lawyer from Pennsylvania, the better lawyer from Pennsylvania, writes these words. See, you don't, you don't know, and your students need to be introduced to him. He is a scholarship kid from Scotland. He's low born, becomes America's preeminent lawyer. He's one of six people to, s uh, to sign both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He's appointed by George Washington to be one of the first five associate justices on the United States Supreme Court. He's epic. And you haven't heard as much about him because he dies in debt and disgrace, um, and he doesn't leave papers. And there are reasons why you haven't heard about him, but he writes the words, we the people, and his name is, I heard it, James Wilson. And here's what he says in Philadelphia. 10,000 people are gathered on July 4th to celebrate the ratification of the Constitution, 1788. And he says, this is the biggest assembly of people in the new world um, in the modern era. The spectacle which we are assembled to celebrate is the most dignified one that has yet appeared on our globe, namely a free people, uh, a people free and enlightened, establishing and ratifying a system of government which they have previously considered, examined, and approved. You've heard of Sparta, of Athens, of Rome. You've heard of their admired constitutions. But today, in all their pomp and pride of liberty, ever furnish to the world anything similar to that which we now contemplate? Were their constitutions framed by those who were appointed for that purpose by the people? After they were framed, were they submitted to the consideration of the people? Had the people as an opportunity of expressing their sentiments concerning them? Were they to stand or fall by the people's approving or rejecting vote? He's saying, we've done something that no one in world history has ever done. We've put this thing to a vote up and down the continent. It's epically democratic. Whether you call it democratic or republican, and by the way, the words mean the same thing 200 years ago. Demos kratia is Greek for rule by the demos, by the people. Republican, uh, a republic is the race publica, the people's thing, the public's thing. They're the same thing. Here's what James Wilson says, by the way, on, 
on democracy, he actually proudly proclaims um, in the Philadelphia Ratifying Convention, he pronounces the Constitution, quote, purely democratical. And in another speech, he boasted that, quote, the democratic, all caps, principle is carried into every part of the government. We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution. We, the people, indeed. Now, what property qualifications um, exist in order to be a member of the House of Representatives? Right. None. How about for the Senate? Right. None. How about for the presidency? None. You have to own a lot of property to be governor of New Hampshire or governor of any other state, except Pennsylvania that doesn't really have a governor. It has a 12-person council. Um, in order to be a senator in any state, you have to have a lot of property, except for Pennsylvania, which doesn't have an upper house, an upper senate. What religious qualifications do you have to be for president? None. 10, 11 of the states, 10 of them have religious qualifications in their constitution. 11 of them have religious qualifications. It's epically democratic for its time. Okay, contra Charles Beard. He knew some of those facts and repressed them, didn't tell you that. I give evidence for that in the end notes to this book. So he's the one person before I came along who actually knew these and he didn't tell you. It's way more democratic than you were taught. The Electoral College was not anti-democracy because the Constitution is not anti-democracy. The House of Representatives is elected in a way that it wasn't under, Congress wasn't under the Articles of Confederation. So ratification moment, epically democratic. What, how did we get the Bill of Rights? You, you heard from Rick, it bubbled up from the people. That's why the words the people appear in five of the first 10 amendments. The first, the second, the fourth, the ninth, the tenth. Of the, it comes from the people. It's crowdsourced. The Constitution actually comes before the citizenry up and down a continent and people say, dudes, you forgot the rights. And that's where we get the Bill of Rights. It's coming from the people. An epic act of free speech is way more democratic than you were taught. So, we do not have an electoral college because they're anti-democrats. They're not. They're proud Democrats. The party that becomes the dominant political party in America proudly calls itself the Democrat Party. And it begins as the Republicans, the Republican Democrats, the Democratic Republicans. James, Thomas Jefferson says, you know, potato, potato. It, it, that, that, they're, they're the same thing. We believe in self-government. So we don't have the electoral college because it's a balance between big and small states. It's not. Pop. We don't have it because they don't believe in democracy. They do believe in democracy, proudly so. More democracy than the world has ever seen. And they say this, you know, when they're trying to sell the thing. Would an ordinary farmer vote for this thing if you say, and the best thing about this is it's really our oligarchical and it's going to actually exclude you from, you know, um, uh, uh, and, your, and your children, by the way, from, from governing yourselves. Well, that's going to sell, okay, because people come to you in New Hampshire, and they have to get your vote, and they have to t explain to you why actually, you know, they feel your pain and blah, 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 okay? And the con this Constitution had to get ratified here in New Hampshire as well, okay? So it's not, I know she says that, it's, you know, uh, that it's, um, I'm picking on, I, I know I'm picking on a 14-year-old, but <laughs> this 14-year-old was not apparently exposed to this book and your 14-year-olds have to be in order to actually discharge their responsibilities as citizens of the most powerful nation the world has ever seen in the 21st century. They can't actually master the present and, and control the future if they don't know the past. And the past is not an electoral college that we had because the balance between big and small states or because they didn't believe in democracy. Now, why do we have the electoral college? No, haven't you been listening to me, my friend? <laughs> if the people are too ignorant, why would you trust them to decide whether to have a constitution or a bill of rights? Or they believe, or, or, or to pick members of Congress? They all believe in direct election of governors too? No, that's not the answer. <laughs> Don't think so. It is, but you know, it's really hard to bribe an entire continent too. So direct, uh, you know, democracy is a great anti-corruption device to some extent. Um, yeah, secret ballot. It is true. You're absolutely right that they. Uh, so here, th there are two things. One is an information technology problem. You can f figure out who's the best person from your district. Um, uh, because you know who the best people are, you know, in southern New Hampshire. 
You can maybe even pick the best person for governor because New Hampshire is a small enough place, but you might not know who the best person for president is because you don't have the internet and a national media. So that is true that democracy, and this connects to what was said before about Montesquieu, there might be concerns that it can work on a certain geographic scale but not a broader scale, but that doesn't make any sense by eight. But, but, but by 1800, you have the emergence of mass political parties, and you actually know what each one stands for, and there is, in effect, direct election, you know, in most of, of the states. And so, so uh, this, this doesn't explain why we keep um, having it after 1800, for example, so it's not that, really, in the end. There is, and I talk about this, there is an information issue about at what scale democracy can work. But with the emergence of mass political parties, you know, you're voting, f actually, so that's not why we have it. That's right, you were listening. I told you there were three themes. Okay, that student gets the A for today. She can go, you know, she, you know, she, she doesn't have to stick around for the rest of the lecture, you know. You, you, get, a, you get a hall pass. Um, because in a direct election system, the South would lose every time because it doesn't let its slaves vote. And James Madison says just that in Philadelphia when another man proposes direct election of the presidency. Who do you think would propose direct election of the presidency? Who believes in democracy? James Wilson. He proposes it and Madison says, right, actually that's the best process, but I've just been doing the math. He's Carl, Carl Rove, avant la lettre. He's this <laughs> political operative. That's who he is. And, and, and he says, I've just been doing the math and we can't go for that in the South because we're going to lose every time. Now, the Electoral College is based on the three-fifths clause. It gives you, Virginia, credit for your southern slaves at a discount, three-fifths, but it actually builds the slavery compromise into the election of the presidency. So now, which state is the big winner? Virginia, a big state with a lot of slaves. In 1800, Pennsylvania has more people, free people than Virginia, way more voters than Virginia because it actually has um, lower property qualifications, and fewer electoral votes. For 32 of the first 36 years, it's a Virginian, and that's because Virginia is a big state with a lot of slaves. It originally has what's now Kentucky and West Virginia too. So th the system was designed for slavery. You all taught that when, and, and, and is, uh, is the division in America, has it ever been between the big and the small states? Of course not. The big states have nothing in common, really, except for being big. <coughs> Texas, California, New York, and Florida are very different from each from the other. The only thing in American history that has ever divided big states versus small states along those lines as such was the debate in Philadelphia about how to count states in, in, in the Senate. The lineup has never been big against small. The lineup is north against south. You know, look at maps of the Electoral College. Uh, you know, today it's coast against the center. Um, um, in 1796 and 1800, you got a southerner running against a northerner, Jefferson against Madison, uh, against Adams. The southerner wins the south. The northerner wins the north. And the swing state is, you know, the Ohio of the time, which is New York, which is actually a, a slave state. Um, and uh, that's the swing, and it swings for Adams the first time around, and it swings for um, uh, Jefferson the second time around. So it's about not big versus small, it's north against south. And but for, and who wins in 1800? That's what we teach our students, you know what? The yeah, south wins, that actually is the right answer. The kick in the head, without the extra votes created by the Electoral College, the three-fifths clause, John Adams wins that second election. In the, in the phrase at the time, he's getting extra votes because they got slaves down south, and his, his uh, uh, results are being padded. Um, this is Gary Wills' thesis in a very powerful book called Negro President that's about Thomas Jefferson. It's, I give you lots more evidence in, in my book. Here's the phrase at the time. Mr. Jefferson is riding into the executive mansion on the backs of his slaves. Every Federalist in, from New England, a sore loser, in the same way we Democrats were after Bush versus Gore or something, um, uh, uh, recognizes that because of the three-fifths clause, Thomas Jefferson's winning that election. It's slavery stupid. Please. Sorry to interrupt, but if that's Please interrupt. If it's true, then why is it still 
that you, you also get a hall pass. That's what I want your students to start to ask themselves. If that's why we have it, why do we still have it? We don't have the information problem anymore, actually, you know, and this was about slave. Yes, let's add, and that's how I end this book, asking you, should we really have, the, the last chapter of this book, which I haven't begun to talk about, is the Constitution of the Future, the Constitution of 2020, 2121, 22, 22. If you can get your students to think about stuff that happened, you know, 225 years ago, you need to get your students to think about what the world should be like, America and the world should be like 225 years from now. What amendments should go next? And you d can't answer that question unless you think about the amendments that have happened thus far, unless you look at those patterns. That was absolutely spectacular, Dennis, those, those patterns. I try to get my students to look at those patterns too because we can't write the next chapter of the chain novel as a society without actually knowing the story thus far. Absolutely right. So I end by telling you what amendments are actually plausible and should be plausible given the story thus far. And one of them is a change. And many amendments have changed the, s the structure of presidential elections. Because this is a sore spot, it keeps festering because it was designed for slavery. It was this jerry built contraption that failed almost immediately because it doesn't let you vote separately for president and vice president. So, although it was said that, you know, John Hancock was being floated for the vice presidency and that's why he signed the thing. In fact, you can't vote for a vice president separately. The vice president is the person who comes in second for the presidency. Uh, uh, and that is a prescription for disaster when the person who comes in second for the presidency has just spent the last few months telling you what a bozo the guy who won is. When Thomas Jefferson is basically saying, don't vote against Adams. Yeah, he was my friend way back when, but he really is kooky and you know, it will just drive us over the cliff. Now, Jefferson comes in second. And so now you have these two people who have been running against each other, awkwardly cohabiting, um, and were something, God forbid, to happen to John Adams, it will be President Thomas Jefferson. Can you spell assassination incentive? I can. <laughs> and I'm not making that stuff up. Do you understand? How many of you know what, chest, what, what um, the man who shot John, uh, James Garfield says as he's being wrestled to the ground in Union Station? No, that's what John Booth says when he shoots Abraham Lincoln. A uh, 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 six-semper tran is from the Virginia um, a motto. Yes, I am a stalwart and Arthur shall be president. And in his pocket is a letter to President Chester A. Arthur with suggestions for who should be in the new cabinet. Okay, that's, I'm not making that up. You can look it up on Wikipedia, five minutes. It's, it's true. Speaking of John Wilkes Booth, whom did he visit the day of the assassination? Andrew Johnson, in his um, hotel, he didn't see him, you know, do not wish to disturb you, are you in, question mark, J.W. Booth, leading some people to think that uh, um, Johnson may have been in on the thing. My, f my best, one of my closest friends is Philip Bobbitt, his uncle was that man. He, Professor Bobbitt is a great constitutional scholar. I'm gonna, he talks about how to interpret the Constitution, I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. His uncle was Lyndon Johnson. And there are these conspiracy theorists to this day say, oh, killed in Texas, Johnson must have had something to do with it. So, in fact, but when you have the president, see, Johnson was handpicked by, um, by Jack Kennedy. Bobby didn't like it, but, but that, and, 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 uh, and I saw the Bobby Kennedy stuff out, out, out there, Neil, so that was great. Um, but, um, uh, and, and Johnson, Andrew, was picked by Abe Lincoln, but when John Adams does not pick Thomas Jefferson, and now these men have to, so, so there were glitches from the beginning. This electoral college system was very badly designed. They didn't anticipate the emergence of national political parties. It was about protecting slavery, and they fixed some of the glitches after the second Jefferson Adams election, but they didn't fix others, even though it was clear to everyone that it was not big state against small state. America is not divided between big and small states. The small states, you know, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Wyoming, Delaware, what the hell do they have in common? Not very much demographically. You know, um, um, Rhode Island actually has um, African Americans. <laughs> you, you know, uh, um, uh, so um, yes, I'm sticking it to you guys. Um, uh, but but, but um, the big states don't have that much in common, the small states don't have so much. It's, it's the coast against the centers, north against south, yes. And boy, if that's the argument, and I do hear that, then every state is stupid. Because you know what we do in California? 
we count up all the votes, meaning the urban centers of Los Angeles and, and San Francisco and, and San Jose. Actually, the people in those places, their votes count equally. You know, even though the people in those places are black people and brown people, you know, and the so here's how we do it in California. We count up all the votes and whoever gets the most votes wins and if it's close, we recount them carefully. Call us crazy. That's how we do it in Texas. That's how we do it in New York and Pennsylvania and New Hampshire and in every state. And this argument, oh, we have to have some balance between rural and urban, if that's right, every state is stupid because no state has an electoral college for its governorship and every governor is a mini president. You know, and most of them want to be president or many of them do and in and, and 48 of the, of the 50 states, I know New Hampshire is one of the two I think that's not, it's a four year term for the governorship. New Hampshire is one of the two that's not, New Hampshire and Vermont. Yeah, okay, so four-year term, veto pen, pardon pen, independent election, they're not prime ministers picked by the legislature, although they were, you see, at the founding in many of the states. So we have governors designed in the image of presidents, but we pick them one person, one vote. And that's actually the new American ideal, and, uh, and we haven't carried, so there are three reasons why I actually offer, among other amendments uh, that will be uh, seriously considered in the 21st century direct election of the president. Here's one. Um, that, and this was mentioned before um, by two of my predecessors, at least. Um, Rick mentioned that James Madison is looking at state constitutions when thinking about state bills of rights, George Mason and others, when thinking about the federal bill of rights. Um, and um, and Dennis, when he's talking about amendments, since then is talking about stuff that states did first, woman suffrage or um, abolition of slavery. Almost everything in the federal constitution was road tested by the states. States are the laboratories. This is uh, actually, I think, um, um, John also mentioned the concept of, of laboratories. I, I, I don't see, is, is John, oh, there you are. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned laboratories in response to a question. Okay, where do we get the idea of putting the Constitution to a vote? Who did that first? Which states? New Hampshire was the second, absolutely. And I know you hate to admit it, but Massachusetts was the first. <laughs> So only two states have put their constitutions to uh, special votes, but that's the best practice, and the U.S. Constitution mimics that. Written constitutions, John told you, 11 of the states have those, you know, not Rhode Island and, and, and Connecticut. So we're gonna have a written constitution, because states have done that. Starting in 1776, we're gonna have three branches of government, because states have basically done that. We're gonna have bicameralism, because states have basically done that, except for Pennsylvania. We're gonna put it to a vote, because that's the best state practice. We're gonna have a strong president slash governor because that's the best state practice. Which two states or three states have that strong governor model? New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York. Um, we're going to have a census and, and reapportionment because that's actually how New York and Pennsylvania do it, that's best. We're gonna actually pay lawmakers, a very democratic thing. This means that it's gonna be open to, to low-born folks because Pennsylvania does that. Um, we're going to get rid of religious qualifications because uh, Virginia has, has done that on issue after issue after issue, best state practices, beginning with like putting the thing to a vote. That's true of the amendment. Americans say, dudes, where are the rights? Because they have bills of rights, in, declarations of rights in the New Hampshire Constitution, you know, part two, in the um, uh, uh, Massachusetts Constitution and elsewhere. So the absence looks pretty conspicuous. The amendments of the future, here's a Mars first principle, predictive, will be stuff that states have road tested first, and direct election of your chief executive is a road tested idea by states. Even though it means that people in cities can outvote people who don't live in cities, you know, get used to it, this is America. Okay, one person, second principle. Okay, so, so stuff, in the federal constitution is not gonna, we're not gonna get proportional representation or multi-party system or all sorts of things. There are societies around the world that do that. They work very well, parliamentary systems, but it's not gonna be done in the US Constitution until New Hampshire and a bunch of other states do it first. You know, they got rid of slavery first, some of the states, New Hampshire did, um, um, uh, women's suffrage, states did it first. Everything in the federal constitution, from the federal constitution itself, to the Bill of Rights, to the later amendments, road tested by states, that will be true of future amendments. Second big pattern, and I think this is implicit in what Dennis was saying. I'm not sure he said it in so many words, 
But basically, every amendment has added to liberty and equality except for prohibition. Um, um, or been orthogonal to it, just not really. But, but we haven't had amendments taking away liberty and equality. That's why I'm for a same-sex marriage amendment and not an anti-same-sex marriage amendment, because one of these actually will fit the arc of history and the trajectory thus far will be make sense going forward and backward looking in a way that um, regressive, repressive amendments actually do not fit the American story. We have one, it's called prohibition. It was not a great success. Okay, so one principle, states, are going to be the laboratories. Second principle, the amendments have to add to liberty or quality, or at least not detract from them, to fit the trajectory, the story thus far. That is how we fulfill the ongoing constitutional project, which is multi-generational. Um, that's how we're actually faithful to our inheritance. This is a liberal argument, a conservative argument of sorts for substantively liberal amendments. Conservative, that's actually who we are as a people. Who we are as a people is more democracy than the world ever had at the founding and proudly so, and then we get rid of slavery and promise equality and, um, and voting rights and then um, um, uh, uh, voting rights for women and the abolition of poll taxes um, in our lifetime. Um, most of you, I think, it's our lifetime we can remember that that's the democratic trajectory. Yes, proud, small d, uh, it's not a bad word at all, uh, trajectory thus far. So the amendments will, I think, add, should add to liberty and equality as they've done so in the past will um, build on what states have done before, and both parties have to sign on, because you can't get two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters um, without both parties buying it. Why might they change the Electoral College? Because the Electoral College today is random but not skewed. Yes, it helped W in 2000, but uh, the day before the election, some people were thinking it might help Gore. That Gore, the day before the election, people were predicting could win the um, Electoral College while losing the popular vote. L um, three months ago, um, four months ago, people were predicting the month before the election, Obama might win the Electoral College while losing the popular vote. Um, in tw um, uh, I see John Kerry up there. If he had won Ohio by 50,000 votes, he would have won the Electoral College while losing the national popular vote by three million. So right now, the Electoral College is random but not skewed. There's one red joker, there's one blue joker, they pop up every so often, you know, just as jokers do when you're playing cards. Um, um, but there's one red and one blue, it's not skewed. So both parties might actually be in favor of this because the current electoral college doesn't favor one or, or the other compared to a national popular vote baseline. So, but most of the arguments that you're gonna hear for the electoral college don't make sense because if they were right, the states are stupid, you know because states don't pick their mini presidents called governors this way. Even though that means people in cities sometimes get to outvote people in, in, in the country, because actually every vote should count equally regardless of where you live. One person, one vote, a basic American idea, even though it wasn't at the founding. And why wasn't it at the founding in the Constitution, one person, one vote? You know because of slavery and race, okay? Because we couldn't do a bunch of things at the founding because of slavery and race. Correct. Because you can't get Virginia on board if Virginia is not going to be able to dominate the new system or at least be, you know, hugely influential. Now, no matter what you do, you're never going to get the South. You know, if you, so what should they have done on slavery now that we begin to think about this? Okay, Amar, you say um, uh, it, um, uh, we need to uh, uh, um, a, a, a take seriously national security. You, you want to get, you, know, you, you need sort of all the states to, to buy. And how are you going to get South Carolina on board, you know, unless you have some compromise with slavery? And Amar says, yeah, you're going to need to compromise with evil. And here's how you compromise. Evil wins the present as long as virtue and good win the future. I'll give you today, but you have to give me eternity in response. Because slavery is wrong. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember a time I did not think so. That's a direct quote from Lincoln. Ab Abraham Lincoln. So slavery is wrong, thesis. And I don't propose to get rid of it immediately because I'm a Republican, says Lincoln, who believes in private property. I'm not a, a radical abolitionist. That's the antithesis. Our way of life depends on foreign oil. I mean, um, slavery. Um, <laughs> um, and um, so we have this thing, and it's not good for us or the, our, our, uh, the, the future, and we can't get rid of it immediately because our way of life depends on it. Thesis, antithesis, what's the synthesis? You have to put it on a path of ultimate extinction. 
we have to have a long-term plan for, you know, freeing ourselves from foreign oil, uh, um, uh, slavery. Um, and, um, uh, and that long-term plan, Lincoln says, might take 100 years, but we have to, so three-fifths now, four-fifths, five-fifths. But in 1820, two-fifths. And in 1860, zero-fifths. Or we can negotiate the details. 1808, until then, you can import all sorts of slaves, but after 1808, no. Or 1888, just at a certain point, as of July 4th, 1876, slavery shall cease to exist in America. That's actually how states get rid of slavery, including New Hampshire's rule. One by one by one is gradually and prospectively, you know, we, you have to put evil on a path of ultimate extinction. Will you persuade the South Carolinians? No, they're not jobs. But you will persuade the Virginians, and that's whom you have to persuade. You do not have to persuade Kim Jong-un. You have to persuade the Chinese, okay? And you have to isolate the evil, okay? Because you will never persuade the evil. But the Virginians, are slaveholders who think slavery is basically bad. They're like T. Boone Pickens, who said, I've been an oil man all my life, but this is gonna be the death of us, and we actually have to you know, get off of it. And so the people who own the most slaves at Philadelphia think it's actually bad business. George Mason, George Washington, Jefferson, Madison, um, Jefferson, not them, Madison. Now, Washington actually does free his slaves. Um, and that's why he's epic in my book. And James Madison doesn't, and that's why I like him, but I don't love him. Um, and he founds a pro-slavery party with Thomas Jefferson um, that becomes the dominant political party and almost kills us, because slavery gets worse and worse and worse. It's a cancer. We could have killed it at the founding, but we didn't, and we let it grow, and it actually almost was the death of the republic. Okay. Um, um, let me say a little bit, and then I'm just going to go over some of the other points uh, that I think came up. This book, having taken you, the reader, and this is written for AP history, AP government. Your best students in junior and senior years can basically engage this. It's, I think, not appropriate for, for anyone below like junior year, a AP history, AP government. Um, these books are written for my fellow Americans, for citizens. We have a common project together. I believe I have a populist vision of the Constitution. It starts with we the people, so I have to write for we the people. You know, I have to write for you, and you have to actually then uh, engage your students. This book, after having gone through the written Constitution from start to finish, this is the new one, America's unwritten Constitution. Them's fighting words for some people. What do you mean, unwritten Constitution? Don't you believe in the written one? Yes, I do. But the written one doesn't say federalism, limited government, checks and balances, separation of powers, rule of law, in so many words. Um, doesn't say one person, one vote. Um, doesn't say separate is inherently unequal. So, um, when you read the written constitution, by the way, this is, I, I'm hoping that one of you at least will start to giggle. Who presides at the vice president's impeachment trial according to the written constitution? Ah, I got, I got a laugh, okay. So who presides, who tries the impeachment, which, which body tries impeachments? Who's the presiding officer of the Senate? The vice president. So under the, that's why it's, a, it's funny. And it would be if, you know, under the text it says the vice president apparently presides. But that can't be right. That's why you're laughing and I'm not making it up. So there are principles that go beyond the rules. Now the trick is how to make sure that in these principles we're not just making sh stuff up. <laughs> um, yeah, my wife is always worrying about it. With the kids, I'm not so good and keeping my, my syntax um, um, <laughs> age appropriate. Um, so we have to go beyond, beneath, behind the words and yet stay faithful to them to deduce their deeper principles like the rule of law. It says it's law and law means that no man can be a judge in his own case and that goes back to Blackstone and it's a very deep principle. So actually it doesn't say specific, the, that the, um, it says the vice president presides at impeachments. It doesn't say even his own and if it did, well then it would, but they didn't. Of course they thought that's an obvious exception to the general principle because they're larger um, uh, um, themes, and one of them is that it's law and, and the rule of law um, and virtue, and no man can properly be a judge in his own case. That goes without saying, in the same way that checks and balances and separation of powers and other things might go without saying. So the trick is, how do you go? Because you have to, in order to decide things. Go beneath, beyond, and behind the words. 
much of what Dennis showed you, those were patterns. Those are not individual sentences of the Constitution, but the Constitution has meaning at levels other than just the, the purely um, uh, uh, word-based and sentence-based level. So we have to have techniques of reading the thing um, and understanding it that go beyond the words while staying faithful to it. And that's what I try to show you in this second book, how you can interpret the Constitution, the rules for proper interpretation. What goes too far when judges and others are really making stuff up and you shouldn't let them get away with that, and when they actually are reading between the lines in faithful ways and doing all this. Let me give you one example and then there was a question. Since um, Rick mentioned the freedom of speech, it, it speaks as if it's a pre-existing thing, the freedom of speech, as if it already exists. And it does, even though before the First Amendment is written, there's already freedom of speech in America and it's baked into the cake. The very process by which we, the people, ordain and establish the Constitution was an epic free speech episode, an entire year, up and down a continent, people talking about how they and their posterity to be governed, Virtually no censorship, people attacking Ben Franklin and George Washington, people defending G Ben Franklin, George Washington. Epic free speech in the very process by which we the people do ordain and establish the Constitution. As part of the Constitution, the deed, the doing, even if the t before the text says so. And where do we get the phrase? From the people, from this act of free speech, where state after state after state in the ratifying conventions, including here in New Hampshire, say we want a First Amendment. We want an explicit textual guarantee of, um, of freedom of, 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 of expression. Um, so in that year, no one dies for the whole year. You compare that to 1776 and 75, or the French Revolution, or the Russian, or the Chinese. It's, it's amazing. It's epic. Syria is not going to be able to do that. I'm skeptical that it w w we'll see, you know, I mean, Egypt is going through all sorts of pangs right now, or uh, um, Libya, or um, uh, Tunisia, or uh, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, where does it say majority rule? Well, it doesn't. But of course, five beat the four on the Supreme Court. And of course, actually, any day, the Senate, by simple majority, could get rid of the filibuster, as I explain in this by simple majority vote. And why do I say that? Because here in New Hampshire, 57 trumped the 47, or maybe it was 59 to 49. 57, 47? Here in New Hampshire, I'll, I'll, I'll just remind myself here for one second. Um, it, the vote here in New Hampshire is 57, 47. In New York, it's 30 to 27 for the Constitution. The Constitution says nine states but it doesn't say what the vote has to be with any state, and it went without saying, it was obvious to everyone, simple majority rule. No filibustering, none of this stuff. Majority rule, that's built into the implicit structure of the Constitution. There are other things too, so we need to figure out w techniques of, of drawing meaning from our actual historical experience. Um, um, they're unenumerated rights, and how do we find them? The Ninth Amendment says that they're unenumerated rights, but now how do we find them? Because they're not textually listed. So this is a book designed to complement the early one. This takes you through the written constitution and your students from start to finish. And this tells you, gives you the tools and techniques for constitutional interpretation. How we can go beneath, beyond, and behind the words while being faithful, deeply faithful to this extraordinary project. I'm gonna say one more word about the project and then start to take questions. Before the constitution in 1787, there's Democracy, oh, back in 1776, see they don't put the Constitution, uh, the Declaration to a vote. And, and here are your choices. You know, you either support it, and if you oppose the Constitution, here are your choices. One, leave, two, shut up, those are your only choices. Those are your only choices, because we're in a war, and this is not, you know, some sort of philosophical seminar. The king has sent over 30,000 troops, and when they arrive, they're going to slit our throats and our wives and our children's throats. So you either support the thing or you leave or shut up. And no one who opposes the Declaration of Independence goes on to any significance in America. They never get elected to anything. People who oppose the Constitution, presidents of the United States, ja future presidents, James Monroe, vice presidents, George Clinton, Elbridge Gerry, justices on the Supreme Court, um, Samuel Chase. Um, Really extraordinary. Who gives us the Bill of Rights? Largely the people who voted against the Constitution, the anti-federalists. The, 
that was a good compromise. Slavery, not so good because they perpetuated an evil compromise rather than giving the future to, to the forces of virtue so that the arc of history, though long, could bend toward justice. So we have to distinguish, you see, when I'm asking my compromises between good ones and bad ones. This was a good one. You lost this time around anti-federalist, but stay in the game. Next time you could win, you know, you're right. We probably should revise the thing, you know, uh, 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 Constitution 2.0, because this one has some, some bugs. S work with us on this project. New Hampshire actually proposes amendments that become the Bill of Rights, and New Hampshire isn't the only one. The losers today can become winners tomorrow. This is, this is pretty extraordinary stuff, and the world will never be the same, you see, because before the Constitution, almost no self-government in the planet, very little at the time, very little for the previous 2,000 years, never on a continental scale, warm weather and cold weather people getting together, people from different religions uh, sp uh, and, and speaking different languages. That had never happened in world history before. A few tiny little democracies that aren't able to sustain themselves militarily, where people profess the same gods, uh, wor worship the same gods, uh, 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 speak the same language, same cu culture. And now America shows it can work on an epic scale, and half the world is democratic today. This is the hinge of all world history, and Charles Beard made you forget all of that, th telling you it's an anti-democratic, pro-property thing, hogwash. So this is the most, and, and, and the amendments have expanded liberty and equality. I um, a chapter one of this book ha begins with the unpretentious, uh, uh, the, the chapter has the unpretentious title, In the Beginning. Um, uh, the unpretentious first sentence is, it started with a bang, as in the big bang, th the democratic, energy created by this year of, of a people, a whole continent, getting to vote on how they, and talk, about how they of our posterity were to be governed, creates tremendous democratic energy that radiates throughout America and the world. It will give us the Bill of Rights. It will eventually give Lincoln his sort of margin of, of, of moral victory. It will lead to woman suffrage. We are still feeling the expansion of the universe, the reverberations from this Big Bang. Um, uh, there was a, a question over here. I saw, I saw a hand up. Um, oh, I promised you guys, so what, here are some things you asked about. So I've talked Republican democracy, not a difference. Colorado and um, uh, drugs. Colorado doesn't have to have its own prohibitions on marijuana. It's permitted to do, but it can't nullify federal prohibitions. In theory, those still stand, but Obama doesn't have to enforce those because he has the pardon power, and the pardon power includes the lesser power of amnesty, um, of simply not enforcing criminal laws, and Jim, Jimmy Carter issued, I saw him here somewhere, you know, issued, um, well, he's in the other room then, you know, a general amnesty proclamation. It's fully constitutional because presidents don't have to enforce criminal laws. The Virginia and Kentucky resolves, well, there actually was a difference between the Virginia and Kentucky resolves. The Virginia resolves um, just basically said, we don't think that this is constitutional, these alien sedition acts, and in fact, I don't either, and it kind of trying to mobilize political opposition against this, kind of Occupy-like, you know, Occupy Wall Street or Tea Party-like. The Kentucky resolutions went even further and suggested that states could nullify federal law. That was never James Madison's view. That was kooky Thomas Jefferson's view, and he wasn't here for the year when the Constitution was ratified, so pay less attention to him. Um, compromises, we've talked about good ones and bad ones. Slavery was a bad one. Um, giving the anti-federalists partial credit, bringing them on board, having them feel part of the project. Very smart. Even if they're not right, as long as they're clearly not wrong, why not try to, to have them feel some ownership of the project? Um, Article 1 versus Article 2, there's some discussions here. So, so here's an example. When you look at the text, it is true, and I actually say it takes an eagle eye, those are my, those are my words, to spot the difference between Article I, only enumerated legislative power, versus Article II, um, uh, a broader idea of executive power um, that's not enumerated. You can see it in the text if you read it with an eagle eye, but no one during the ratification period focused on that. Why then does the broader power prevail? Here is why. Not because of what the text says, but because of stuff that happened afterwards. We read Article 2, I claim in a spe this chapter of this book, the Edward Constitution, through a very special prism. We read it through the spectacles of George Washington. Again and again and again, presidents can do things, not because the text says so, but because George Washington did it and glossed the text. Here's what he did. 
He asserted that he could fire cabinet officers at will, even though it doesn't say that explicitly. He asserted that he could recognize foreign... Where does it say that Barack Obama, at a certain point, can recognize the Syrian rebels as the lawful government of Syria or Libya? It doesn't in the text, but George Washington took that position vis-a-vis France. Um, where does it say um, that presidents can negotiate treaties secretly? It doesn't, but George Washington did. Um, can define American foreign policy. Text doesn't quite say that, but George Washington did with the Neutrality Proclamation. So on issue after issue after issue, I'm saying when it comes to the, the executive, our actual Constitution depends less on what the text says than on what George Washington did in filling out the ambiguities of the text. Please. Uh, is your second book a type of rebuttal uh, against textualism or originalism? It's a, only a partial rebuttal because I believe in textualism a lot. That's why I wrote this first one. I thought I had the, the credibility to write the second book because I'm not, I'm not a BS person. I think that this is the most detailed textual exposition of the Constitution that exists on planet Earth. I actually do. I think I actually went through the text from an originalist point of view with more care. There's no other, I mean, these are not comparable. <laughs> and there are not very many other books actually about the Constitution that are genuine, the whole thing, not, not the freedom of speech clause, the, free, the, the, the self-incrimination clause, but the whole thing, they're not, because it's a hard thing to do, to actually wrap your mind around the whole thing. So, so I, because I actually thought, okay, I've proved that I take the text really seriously and original intent really seriously, now I'm gonna have to show you that that's only half the story because in fact, that doesn't explain why even Justice Scalia does a whole bunch of things that he can't, so, so does a criminal defendant have the right to testify in his own case? Justice Scalia believes he does. Every Supreme Court justice believes he does. That's not controversial. And yet, that doesn't, it doesn't say so in the text. And at the time the Constitution was ratified, no criminal defendant in America was allowed to take the stand in his own defense, not in any state court, not in any federal court. Even as late as the Civil War and the 14th Amendment, only, I think, one state, Maine, allowed a criminal defendant to take the stand in his own defense. But today, that's an uncontroversial right. I say that because you're allowed to have unenumerated rights. And un where did unenumerated rights come from? From actual practices. As time went on, states began to let criminal defendants testify, and at a certain point, actually, that became an unenumerated right, just like the right to have appointed counsel and a right of marital privacy and all sorts of things that actually emerge from the lived experiences of the American people uh, 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 over time. We're allowed to have, according to the text, more rights. Never f less. It's a, one, it's a ratchet. Um, more rights are okay, unenumerated, less aren't. So, and the, just the pure textualist can't make sense of the Ninth Amendment, which says, dude, you gotta go beyond the text. There are things that are not textually listed. The enumeration of certain rights in, you know, in this Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. It doesn't tell you where to find them, but it actually saying you may not find them in the text, and yet they really may be rights of the people. Now, how do we find them and not make stuff up? That's what I'm trying, and I gave you one example. Well, you look to actual lived practices and experiences post-founding um, that have generated all sorts of rights that ordinary Americans believe in. Um, so it's a partial rebuttal, but only a partial one because I hope I've persuaded you. I know I've come to the end, um, uh, and, but I'm, I'll stick around at lunch, and I'm happy to have you email me afterwards, and I'll s stick around for the afternoon session, but I hope I've persuaded you that I take the text really seriously. I take the history really seriously, too, and, but I also believe there is more to the project than text and original intent, and I don't want people to make stuff up, and so you need to know what the rules actually are. When you can go beyond text and original intent, and when it would be wrong to do so, and that's what I try, and it, and it turns out that's complicated, so I, you know, I gotta inflict on you, uh, you know, another month's, uh, uh, a second month of homework here. Um, I, uh, we, we can go a little bit longer. I know we, we have to um, uh, break for lunch very soon, so um, a couple more questions, maybe? Thank you, Joe. Um, as far as uh, the, an amendment to change the Electoral College, what 
could the states do to be a laboratory? Um, I show you at the end of this book how, in fact, we could move to direct election of the presidency without even a constitutional amendment. Um, there's a thing called the National Popular Vote Initiative Compact in which states can choose, if they like, and, uh, a, and a bunch already have, um, to, California already has, and, and Maryland already has, and, and, uh, uh, and they've promised that if enough other states buy in, we're not there yet, but if enough other states buy in, we in California and these other states will give our electoral votes not to the person who wins our state, but the person who wins the national popular vote. We could, under the Constitution, ca uh, the state legislature, you know, pick the electors ourselves. We could let the voters of our state pick them, and that's what every state pretty much does. There are a couple of small wrinkles in, in Maine and Nebraska. But most of them say, winner take all um, uh, state elect uh, popular vote. But a legislature could, in a state, say, we're going to give our electoral votes to the person who wins the national popular vote. And a bunch of states have pledged that they will do so if enough other states join on. If states totaling 270 electoral votes take this pledge, then whoever wins the national popular vote will win the electoral votes from those states totaling 270, and you will have direct election of the president um, without even a formal constitutional amendment. I explained in the last chapter of this book how, in fact, you could even have, if I could persuade four people, they have to be the right four people, you could move to direct election even in the next election if I can persuade four people. The two presidential candidates and their vice presidential running mates could shake hands in front of the, into all the American people, like the Jim Lehrer, you know, watching and say, we are going to agree to abide by the national popular vote rather than the electoral college vote. And, they, and I show you how they could make that happen, in fact. Um, and so, so what decides elections today? And you might think, recounts. But decides elections are concession speeches. We actually don't usually. So, so the parties themselves actually often decide who, who won. A ex post, they decide that with concession speeches. Ex ante, they could actually decide to play by national popular vote rules. I know that's like almost science fiction, but I show you in a very detailed way in the last chapter how that could happen. Before the 17th Amendment, direct election of senators, many states had already improvised a way of achieving, in effect, direct election of senators, even without a formal constitutional amendment. As early as the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you see, what were those all about? The parties nominated their senatorial candidates before the state Senate, uh, before the, the state legislative election. So if you wanted Abe Lincoln to be the U.S. Senator from Illinois, vote for Republicans for state legislature. If you wanted um, uh, Douglas to be the, the, the U.S. Senator, vote for Democratic legislature, uh, legislators for your state. So they turned the state legislative election into a kind of referendum on who you wanted to uh, be your senator, which is a it's, it's an improvisation. It, it's not exactly, but, but there are um, improvisations moving toward direct election of senators well before the 17th Amendment. And in the same way, we could improvise direct election of the president even without a constitutional amendment, um, as, as mind-bending as that might seem. Okay, and then. Um, one, one of the questions you seem to be posing is, you know, those unenumerated rights. And yes. I think, uh, wouldn't you say the answer is going to be found in the preamble and then also in the Declaration of Independence? Like, What's the purpose of government, and what is a human being? Yes. You know, what will I, make human beings flourish? I, I, I agree with you. So if we, I, I gave you, there are many sources of unenumerated rights. I gave you one, actual lived practices um, of the American people, and, and state constitutions, and state statutes, and just look, but here's another. There are iconic texts. The Constitution is what we have in common as Americans, actually. As Americans, some of us are Christians and some of us aren't. And, and some of us, uh, our families came from one part of the world and others from another part of the world. What we have in common is not even fully language, not religion, not ethnicity. We have the Constitution in common. It's what makes us Americans. Um, it's our Taj Mahal, our Queen Elizabeth, our Eiffel Tower, our Marseilles, but it's not the only thing that is a creedal statement of what we Americans believe. There are others. You mentioned one. I have a whole chapter on what I think are six iconic texts. The Declaration of Independence. What other great texts would you nominate, you know, it's like the five or six texts that say what Americans actually believe kind of constitutionally that's not the written constitution, um, but it really is what Americans share in common? as Americans. Declaration of Independence. Uh, yes? Gettysburg Address. 
Um, I, we could do all Lincoln. So I, I actually picked six. So I picked the Declaration. I picked a Gettysburg, although I could have picked the second inaugural. I could have picked all Lincoln. I wore my Lincoln tie yesterday. Anything else? I could have picked that, but I had one president. So those, these are some of my semi-finalists. I, I had only one thing from a president. I had one court case. I had one statement from a, um, a non-government official, you know, who I think I picked, I have a dream speech, but same, same uh, thought. Um, if you were picking a case, there are only three that you're going to nominate. They're up, uh, they're up on Mount Rushmore for cases. You're going to nominate, the three big cases are Brown, and that's the one I pick. Or you could have said McCullough, or you could have said Marbury. So I picked Brown and the Declaration of Independence, and the Gettysburg Address, and the I Have a Dream speech, and I picked the Federalist Papers that were invoked earlier, and I, pi and, and I picked one more. You'll have to read the book for the last one. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, you don't have to buy it, you just have to read it. Um, um, but this proves, and I've done this, you can, if you go on YouTube, you'll find me doing, playing this game on YouTube in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You'll see me playing this game in um, Malibu, California. Every single time I play this game, people give me the same um, answers, which proves that we are Americans, you know, that we actually do have a constitutional culture. It goes beyond just the words of the Constitution, so it sets pr pr principled boundaries for ways to go beyond the Constitution without making stuff up. Here's one th the Declaration of Independence is invoked by the Gettysburg Address, and again by Dr. King, who actually is speaking in the uh, Lincoln M Memorial, and its words get codified in the 14th Amendment. That first sentence of the 14th Amendment, citizens, we're all born citizens, that is an idea that we're all created equal. We're all, uh, so it's Lincoln's riff on Jefferson's language about created equal, so these things connect up. The Ninth Amendment says there are unenumerated rights. The Fourteenth Amendment is a gesture toward the Declaration of Independence, rightly construed and bleached of Jefferson's sort of slavocratic and worst instincts. Um, and why are all these things connected to Jefferson and Lincoln? You know, because all these things are, because they are the two leaders of our two great political parties, um, which are built into our unwritten system of government. I have a whole chapter on the political parties um, and the role that they play since some of you were asking about parties and factionalism and compromise. Maybe one more question right here. You started by introducing three themes yes. of, of uh, pro-democracy, pro-slavery, and national security. Yes. Uh, I didn't hear much about national security. Yes. And I would like to, um, if, if you can end, I know lunch is, lunch is in moments, but uh, if you could speak to national security, yes. past, present, today. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, two minutes. <laughs> Why did people, Montesquieu, d democracy has never existed on a, on a large scale. And Montesquieu theoretically says it can't be done. Now why would you ever, if you're a New Hampshire farmer, you know, your first question, why the hell do we need this, you know, big continental government, the likes of which we've never seen before in world history, democracy's never worked on a continental, why should I go for this? Here's the answer you've been taught, Federalist 10. Now, if you had an answer to the New Hampshire farmer, would you wait to your 10th op-ed to make it? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No one reads Federalist 10. Not at the founding, not for the next hundred years. Lots of Federalist papers are discussed, not Federalist 10. Federalist 10 is read today because a man named Charles Beard featured at front and center, and, I, and Douglas Adair proved this conclusively. This is chapter one of my book. So, and, he, and here's the argument. Oh, you should not trust your neighbors across the street who will go into New Hampshire legislature because you know, uh, democracy is going to work much better on a continental scale when you're governed by three people from New Hampshire that you, know, you don't even know. That's not going to sell in New Hampshire. And so that's not the leading arm. Today, since the claim was the Articles of Confederation was every bit as ineffective as the United Nations is today, why would you ever let your mind Rome free, why would you ever today vote for world government with a world army and a world president and a world legislature that could directly tax you and regulate you? There's only one thing that would ever get you to do that. Martians. <laughs> Correct. And the argument for the Constitution was we almost lost the last war against Britain, we're going to lose the next one, and we, because, uh, um, and the only way we're going to actually survive is if we create a much stronger federal government that can create an army, 
kick the Brits out, um, cause, um, kick the uh, Spanish out, kick the French out, kill the Indians, control the continent, manifest destiny, Monroe Doctrine, and we, you know, no one will mess with us. And that's actually in the Federalist Papers, and it's way before 10. It's the Federalist 2. It's the Federalist 4 to 6. It's the Federalist number 8 that summarizes the whole theory. This is the argument for union. It's a geostrategic argument. And by the way, we want ordinary people to be able to vote because they fought for the American Revolution and we're going to need them next time around. And so actually democracy, uh, there's a national security argument. Why do blacks get the vote after the Civil War? Because Denzel Washington is there with Matthew Broderick, you know. Um, and women get the vote after, uh, during World War I as a war measure. And in my lifetime, 18-year-olds get the vote because if you're old enough to fight and die in Vietnam, you're old enough to vote on whether we should be in that war in that first place. And, and Go even Barry Goldwater believes that, okay. So there are connections between national security and um, democracy. And here's the final point. What makes America free for most of our history is not the Bill of Rights, which isn't even part of their plan. Boy, they were really stupid. They didn't even think they needed one. And when we get one, it's not enforced by courts. What makes America free for the first 150 years is not the Bill of Rights, it's not courts. I know Justice Souter might not like me to say that it's not courts, but it's not. They're third out of three. Um, and they're, they're what makes America free for the first 150 years is we have no standing army in peacetime of any significance. Just 5,000 people at the founding big enough to kill the Indians. So that's why you're free because you don't have to pay taxes for a big army. New Hampshiremen will like that. Um, and um, uh, you've got these massive moats called the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean that keep the rest of the world at bay. And it's not Boston or New York or San Francisco. It's only Pearl Harbor as late as World War II, which is way the heck out there because they can't reach us because we've got these massive moats. And that's what makes us free. The last time foreigners drew blood on American soil in the heartland before 9-11, was the War of 1812, okay? So that's what makes you free, is you don't have an army, no one's sitting on you, you know, we can beat the Mexicans if we have to, you know, we can beat the uh, Canadians if we have to, and, and we're free, and we don't need a big army for that, no one will mess with us now. And the rest of the world is tyrannical, so just leave us alone, Washington's farewell address. Now here's the point, that makes no sense for our students going forward. Constitution is premised on old world versus new world. We're going to have a, a new world democracy, kind of world government for the new world, and the, the rest of the world can go to hell. You know, we just don't, they, we don't want them to mess with us, and we won't. F f today we have one world, and with one world challenges and opportunities, the internet, pandemic viruses, international terrorism, uh, international trade, the gap. So our students. You know, and the rest of the world is democratic in a way that it never was before. We won the last century. It's becoming American, the rest of the world. And America is becoming more global. My students look like the United Nations now, way more than they ever did before. So our students need to understand how we got where we are and how going forward they have to be every bit as creative and imaginative as were the founders who gave us the idea of a continental democracy, which was completely audacious at the time, or Lincoln who actually proposes to get rid of slavery immediately, universally, you know, without compensation. They need to see how in the past audacious people rose up and actually realized that they needed to, you know, what they needed to preserve and what they needed to change. And today, going forward, actually, it's one world. That's the challenge, actually, um, that we have to communicate to our students. And we can't do that about how they need to be masters of the present and the future unless they know the past. Thank you.